I, you know, we all want to talk about the market. Where is it going? What are we going to do with the United States having $20 trillion of debt, owing a, a deficit of $500 billion a year? Where's the world going? Where's Canada going? So you heard today from Ellis. Charlie talks about ETFs. I'm 180 degrees opposite of that. You talked about, Sheila was fantastic, by the way, before. And those comments were terrific about how, what, how she started. Momentum investing, daily trading. We love the ignored and unloved, and we hold things for an average of 10 years. So my first visit to Toronto was in <coughs> 1967. I went to visit Massey Ferguson. I started a, my career as an analyst on the sell side. That's a declining breed. We did research. I graduated on a Friday, went to work on a Monday, and Michael Steinhardt, Michael Steinhardt quit on Friday at Lowe Broads where I started. And I picked up his industries. Farm equipment, that's why Massey. Auto parts, that's why I went to see Vanderhout, which was a company that sold shock absorbers in Canada, and a whole bunch of companies. So um, Mo asked me to be here, and I decided this was phenomenal for me as an opportunity. I couldn't do it two years ago. I couldn't do it last year. This year, my auto parts conference ended last night in Las Vegas. So I came in and uh, delighted to do this. Uh, but knowing what I'm doing at 3.30, I kind of said to myself, Mario, you remind yourself of uh, J. Lo's third husband. If I were her third husband on the wedding night, I would look at her and I'd say, hey, J. Lo, I know what I'm supposed to do, but how am I going to make it different and interesting? So, <laughs> so on that note, be patient for 10 minutes. I'm going to talk about a couple of things, one of which is the uh, wealth of the consumer down south below the border, and then talk about the balance of payments and what that has to do with NAFTA, what does that have to do with global trade, and what's that going to have to do with the new head of the... Ah, one of the first companies I visited, because I also followed the media and telecom area, was Ted Rogers, and in his book he points out that this investor uh, didn't like them going private, and I, uh, at $35, and I said it was worth $125, so I had a little kind of fun years ago. Any event, the other part is that you had two speakers. One before me and one after me. One owns a basketball team in Boston after me, and one owns one in Milwaukee. And you heard from Blake about real estate in New York and the Hudson Yards. Well, how would you like to buy a company that's selling at $220 a share? You get a basketball team almost for free, and you get $500 million worth of air rights just outside of the, of the uh, Madison Square. $500 million for free. And you're only asking for $1,000. Um, so I'm delighted to be here, chat about our favorite subject, how to make money by understanding a business. When I was at Columbia Business School, I was very fortunate. I had a class with a professor by the name of Roger Murray who taught security analysis. And I'm more fortunate because one of my classmates is sitting in the back there and I hadn't seen him for 50 years. I had red hair, I was seven foot tall at the time, so he recognized me. That's me. So what are we going to talk about today? It's fairly uncomplicated. We have a team in New York, and they come to work. We <clears throat> white knuckle each other to uh, look for stocks. We gather information, look at public companies. So if you have any that you want me to look at, we'd be delighted. Nano caps, micro caps, small caps, large caps, anywhere, anywhere in the world. And uh, that's we unfortunately went public in 1999 through Merrill Lynch. And uh, I didn't tell Corzine this, but uh, we turned Goldman down. <laughs> I uh, went through Merrill Lynch and Smith Barney. So I started the firm 10 years afterwards in 1977. 1977, you could buy stocks at five times EBITDA. Nobody wanted to buy stocks. So we did research driven, absolute return, not beat the market. We wanted to make 10% real, plus inflation. Inflation at that time was <laughs> 10, 12%. Uh, so we look for what we call the private market value. If you have a public company, what is it worth if it's private? And then we said we're not in the academic business, so we want to have some visible dynamic, a catalyst that would surface that. So the, uh, one of my colleagues uh, came up with the idea of what we do is gather, array, project, interpret, and communicate. So we look at a company, we try to find out everything about it. So we've been following industries like the auto industry for 40, 50 years and have accumulated and compounded knowledge about the business. So what does it mean to sell parts? What does it mean to do OE? What does autonomous vehicles mean? What does it mean for uh, self-driving cars? And what does it mean for class A trucks? And how do you make money on that on a global basis? 
So when you think about the seven and a half billion people in the world, there was about 1.2 billion cars. And this is where we do research, we cover it around the world. I'll do it quickly, because I'd rather ask a question. POSP is not sex term, it's plain old stock picking. Okay, let me go back to that so we don't have any misunderstanding. No religion, no sex, no politics here. Plain old stock picking. Private market value, what is a company that's public worth? What will the next guy that's coming up later, Steve, with a private equity firm, what would he pay to buy the entire company? And we want to get there ahead of him by at least a year or two. And uh, the catalyst could be a variety of things. I'll do it quickly, a regulatory change. Uh, for the uh, CFTC will change the rule, or the uh, FCC in the United States will change the rule, and you'll figure out what does that mean and who benefits from that. Death of a founder, repurchase stock. And then what we have more currently is what they call activism. Activism is where one of these uh, activists, uh, like Dan Loeb, or the one that's on television lately, Ackman, try to stir the pot and make things change. And uh, so today, we'll go over this very quickly. What do I like? You have a long runway in housing in the uh, uh, United States. Do, will the Gen Zs and Millennials, will they have enough money after they pay off student debt to buy housing? And if they do, where are they going? Yesterday or two days ago, Lenard just announced the deal where they're buying a, a major U.S. stick builder in the U.S. We think there's a long runway, the whole ecosystem's attractive, we like to pick our spots. Another area is infrastructure. The roads in the U.S. are awful. The potholes, the uh, bridges, the uh, uh, Society of Civil Engineers rates the bridges in the United States every four years. They rated them and improved it to D plus from a D minus. The amount of money that's gonna be available, and that's before Trump came into power, and the waterways, you know, think about Flint, Michigan, where there's a whole infrastructure that's required, lots of ways to make money. Then you have organic, you have natural, the RWA, Raised Without Antibiotics as a company here in town that we're a large shareholder, uh, Maple Leaf uh, Foods, terrific RWA. Uh, pet parents, this is something we came up with which is fairly uncomplicated. There are 94 million cats in the United States, 88 million dogs. <laughs> eight million companion horses. The entire ecosystem has got terrific ways to earn a return. And then what is Gen Z and what are the millennials like? Live entertainment. I was asked before about the gambling stocks. That's live entertainment. Uh, MGM, Steve Wynn, uh, Wynn International. And then the more obvious ones, baseball, basketball, soccer. I can buy for you a team at half the price that a guy by the name of David, uh, Derek, ooh, Derek Jeter paid for the uh, Marlins. Half the price, it's called the Atlanta Braves. And you buy it by buying shares at a public company called the Braves. The stock's 23, there are 58 million shares. You multiply that, you're paying 1.4 billion, but you get the land around it, and I hope Blake is listening. You get the land around it, you get the uh, stadium for free, and uh, it's owned by John Malone, who's a, a, an architect. And even I like the military. These are some of the stocks we like. Uh, we're excluding Chinese military at the moment. Uh, case studies, I would normally do this, Bo, but I'm not gonna do it. And uh, this would be Madison Square Garden, and I can go over how you look at it. 2.4 uh, million shares, outstanding. MSG is the symbol. They have a $200 stock, 4.8 billion, a billion for in cash, the real estate values, the team values, all of that, what they're doing, and we buy the stock. Equipment rental companies, Herc, URI, Ashtead. Ashtead is a London-based company. That is a phenomenally interesting business. And sparkling water. Sugar is out, but get some lately. Um, and it's good for the afternoon. So I'm gonna stop here, but just one last thought, Mo, and then we can sit down. When I started the firm in 1977, I did, I tried to raise $100,000, I wasn't very successful at it. I had three and a half kids and owed money to, still from school don'ts. $65,000 with Berkshire Hathaway would be worth $176 million. Never a dividend, stock dropped all the way down to $40,000 in 1999 when TMT was popular. It dropped again and now it's selling at $261,000. You multiply that by a million and a half shares and you multiply that by 45%, you can see how much Buffett is worth and it's a living. So you got 22.5%, 22.5% Kager, and uh, 
You know, if you, if you had a million dollars in 77 and you just said put it away, 2.7 billion. It's not a bad number. One company, pick it, can you find it again? And then there's a guy locally here who I see at the Berkshire Hathaway meetings. You put the money with him and here's what you did. You did okay. So this is my cousin, but I don't want to spend any time with him. <laughs> nah, forget it. Eh. This is a good one. Where is the market going and what companies do we want to buy to earn a return over the next three or four years? And that's what we do every day. So what companies, we saw 41, 40 companies in the last two days in Las Vegas on the auto parts industry. Which ones do we want to own? Which don't we want to own? And that's it, the investment process I said, and I'm gonna uh, take 30 seconds, uh, the euro versus the dollar, balance of payments. Balance of payments, why is that important? What is all this BS over trade negotiation? What does it have to do with the rest of the world? Very simple, $20 trillion US GDP, 80 trillion in the global marketplace. $20 trillion GDP is made up of inv consumer investments uh, and uh, state and local spending and net exports or imports. We as a country, US, $500 billion trade deficit. And that subtracts 2.5% from real growth. That's what the mindset of these tops down individuals are. So those are the uh, balance of payments. I'll do it quickly, you'll get a quiz. A trade deficit of 550. But the real problem is the following, not Japan anymore, that's the problem. That's why you negotiate the way they're doing. The guy that's doing it now really knows what he's doing. He's a PE guy by the name of Wilbur Ross and Lighthouser are very good. Well, let's see what happens. Are they negotiating that to solve the problem with Poyang or are they solving the problem with regards to the balance of trades? And how important is that to GDP growth and how important is that to jobs? Hey, no sex, no religion, no politics. Let me uh, stop there and uh, let's do oh, the consumer wealth. Let me leave one sign up here. Just, Go ahead, keep going. No, no, I don't want to do that. Get I have sit down, it'll be I more comfortable. I have tenure. Here's the problem. <laughs> the uh, assets in the US, net worth, 95 trillion, and uh, that's going up. But here, the real problem is student loans in the United States. Student loans are a drag on millennials, and they go to school and their professors tell them capitalism and the banks were the cause of it. And this is a problem. It's going to linger for a long time. Can we, can we oh. finish that thought? No. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. We're... No, I don't come, get... come, come back to student loans. How does that play out? How do you capitalize on it, or how do you avoid it? <laughs> what we try to do is to suggest to the ruling po po political types that you, like capital equipment, if you go to school and you have to take a loan, you should be able to use a depreciation accounting against your current earnings so that you can look on that as a cap investment in IP and you basically use that and take a tax deduction. So don't pay for the loans down to after tax, but do a pre-tax. Secondly, Let's get back to basics, and that is give free education, whether you're at Western, UT, or uh, uh, McGill. Uh, I don't want to mention everyone. So, <laughs> thank you. So, let me, I, I didn't mention yeshiva, stop. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let me actually come back. Something on your slide, and I couldn't resist that temptation. You had the Raptors, and then you had Russell Martin, which you poo-pooed. Let's start with the Raptors. Well, what was the story there? The story is tonight. There's a seventh game, and it deals with the Dodgers and the Astros. And when you look at the Raptors, when you look at the teams, you get very tribal. So that's passion, and passion equals loyalty, and loyalty equals following. And so, if you uh, give you a, an example, there's a, a, something called American football. There's a guy named Bob Kraft, who I happen to know. He put $175 million into own a football team in Boston, of all places. <laughs> and uh, today it's worth $3.5 billion. So, what, how do you grow that value and should you buy one? The answer is uh, I would like to buy them for free. So, by buying a baseball team, by buying the Atlanta Braves at $23 you're basically paying three quarters of the, of the price somebody would buy to own it and that value is gonna grow and some, instead of buying a newspaper in town, you're gonna, somebody will buy that uh, over time. Right. So Mo, that's as simple as that. Do you wanna own a sports franchise? Do you wanna have fun? You get, uh, Lazarus didn't talk about it, did he? 
You didn't a little ask. bit. Okay, and then, you know, so he, he paid retail. I mean, he's a smart guy <laughs> buying retail. How can you trust the guy that likes to buy retail? I'm sorry, only Millie's do I buy retail. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> I think he made a billion dollars on retail, so I think he did okay. But let me ask you, coming back, because you've done a phenomenal job building Gabelli as a, both as a brand and as an institution, now a public company. Um, and obviously the performance has also been uh, as good over a very long period of time. Could you talk a little bit about, which I've asked every speaker, some of your dramatic mistakes, most uh, educational errors? You don't have enough time for that. <laughs> uh. You know, come on, I, I like to use a baseball analogy. This guy, Ted Williams, batted 400. He was the best hitter of all time. He made out three out of five times. Some of my mistakes you'll never, you'll never see, okay? That's why I'm asking you about it. No, but you'll never see them because I didn't buy them. <laughs> so Netflix, even though we compounded client assets at 15.5% for 40 years and charging 80 basis points, and uh, Charlie Ellis thinks we do poorly, um, <laughs> I'm not knocking Charlie. He's a great guy and a good friend, but... Uh, Different points, of, yeah, I, I know, I know. The, um, so uh, uh, Netflix, I mean, I've been following media and entertainment for 40 years or 45 years, and uh, you know, there's no excuse for not having stayed focused on that one. As the second one's, I bought a company in 1970 called Earl Scheib. Uh, they are a car repainter. Any car, any color, 1995. And in fact, I did take my car there, and they painted the windshields, and they painted the tires. Uh, but for, I paid X dollars for it. 40 years later, we sold it, Mo, and it was the same price. So, and then we have the obvious ones that uh, really don't work out, okay? So, uh, but we try, we look at nano caps, micro caps, small caps, the whole ecosystem. So our 40 analysts are assigned to where we think we can do well over the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. Independent of that, you try to look at three dimensions. You like to look at artificial intelligence, robots. Um, Sony is coming out with a little robot. They announced it yesterday called IBO. I don't know if that's A I B O, $1,700. The population's aging. Uh, and uh, that is going to be a home companion. So we look at all these new dynamics. We don't uh, invest in them until they're ignored and unloved. And how do you manage to allocate to these smaller uh, strategies when given that, you know, Cabelli's now $30 billion? 40. 40? Oh. <laughs> Unless the market was down a lot today. No, it increased since I got this bio, I guess. <laughs> no, but anyways, it's $40 billion. How are you able to kind of go that low in the capital structure? Patience, tolerance. I have a team here that says they run a concentrated $300 million portfolio. They have 12 names. We're in our Mighty Mites fund, and we picked that name uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, we probably have 300 names. <laughs> and so how do we, there's a company that I happen to like, RLJ Entertainment, I don't wanna tell you the name, but it's uh, five million shares, the stock was $1.50, $7.5 million. I was just sitting there and buying it at a price. And then we allocated to our Mighty Mites Fund. <laughs> Got it. Patience. So, patience. And we don't try to turn over. I mean, I have a company, Monarch Cement, located in Humboldt, Kansas. I think I bought 10,000 shares in the last eight years. <laughs> you, somebody has a thin stock, I'll buy it. So let me turn the corner a little bit. Um, come back, because you alluded to China. So just, I, I'd love to hear, given where the markets are, where geopolitics are, and again, you mentioned the balance of trade in China, but where are you really seeing the risks and opportunities today, given the geopolitical dynamics? Okay. Assuming we were here in 1955, I picked that year for a reason I'm not going to tell you. There's two and a half billion people in the world. Today, there's seven and a half billion. There's one and a half billion in China and India, three billion people. When I, my first visit in 1981, uh, two things. They love to gamble, love to drink. And so we follow drinking anywhere in the world. Whatever you drink, anywhere, whether it's uh, Diageo, Pernod, Remy, Martin, Campari, Suntory, or Baidu. So think about each 1% change in disposable income in China, and it's growing. That results in about a 1.8% expenditure on luxury goods and commodities, uh, uh, goods that like travel. And so you want to participate in that. And so how do you do it? And uh, drinking is not 95%, 92% of what they drink in China is Baidu. 
And so what happens if they go to 6% more, uh, Remy Martin or Diageo or Pernod? Not beer. No Molson's. Go ahead. Uh, so that's China. That's what we do every day. We think about, we have an office in Shanghai for the last 10 years. We had one in Hong Kong for a while until the guy decided not to work. <laughs> so just to, to paraphrase, you're saying the greatest opportunities today, Asian alcohol? <laughs> like, what, what are we talking about? All right, listen, if you don't drink, it's your problem. Independent of all of that. <laughs> Look, where do you find something that the consumer wants that has a high premiumization, a high disposable income, and is, more importantly, it has pricing power in case inflation goes back to 4%. How do you find companies that are huge cash generators, that have teams of managements that do it globally, and have 3 billion people that want to consume your product, and they will consume it at an increasing rate over time? So, yeah, we like that. Okay. And we're, and we're just the other side of that question. Where are you seeing the greatest risk today? Uh, bonds. Uh, are you doing anything about it? No. <laughs> we, are, we, we don't give wealth to manage, we're not wealth managers. We are basically very narrow. We're like the hospital and you have a knee problem, you come to me, I'm the best knee guy in the world. We are equity managers, equity managers. And by the way, my team doesn't like that. They want to be wealth managers, but one of our teammates has 98% of the vote. <laughs> Hey, Corzine was voted out of office. I'm not going to be voted out. <laughs> Sorry, John, but you know, it is what it is. And I grew up on a farm <laughs> in the Bronx. So could you talk a little bit? Of, <laughs> could, you, could you give us a little background into your upbringing and how that may have contributed to success you've evolved to today? Uh, it's not complicated. I uh, had my first job at five. and. Uh, I uh, was started caddying. I used to hitchhike to a golf course in uh, Sunnydale Country Club in Westchester County. And they, uh, I would hang around until 3 or 4 o'clock when everybody else left. And the specialists would cut the day short. They would come up and talk about stocks. Duh! So I started buying stocks when I was 12 or 13. Simple as that. And I didn't get the passion for what I wanted to do until I went to graduate school. And I had this guy, Roger Murray. There was Greenwald as the new professor I brought in about 20 years ago, but it was, uh, you know, Graham Dodd Murray, and he taught security analysis, and the moon, the sun, and the stars came together, and I said, Cooperman and Sandberg, by the way, are my classmates, and we used to share, and I used to, I used to drive to, work, uh, to school every day. They're lucky they're alive, the way I drive. <laughs> so, uh, coming back to the market, so you, you were picking your 12-year-old kid, you're picking these stocks, so, again, how did that take you to becoming a professional investor? Uh, essentially, right out of school, and I got my first job at Low Bros. We had a correspondent in uh, Toronto, I think it was Richardson, and uh, basically I said, I graduated on Friday, I joined Monday, I didn't take the three months off that the new generation takes, and I had, uh, <laughs> I had uh, basically uh, Steinhardt quits, and I picked up his industry. It's not complicated. So, uh, again, And then what happened is I was at other firms, and in 19, I was at William D. Witter. They merged into Drexel. I stayed and said to Tubby Burnham, I love you, Tubby, but I want a small firm. And I looked around, and I had a guy uh, in Denver that I had breakfast with him one day, and he says, Mary, what are you doing? Stop thinking about going to work with XYZ. Uh, start your own business, and that's what I did. Um, and by the way, my first client was from Toronto. And how did, how did you learn, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, coming back to that early age when you uh, started picking stocks, how did you learn to handicap your risk? And how does that translate into your conviction and downside protection Well, I, you know, the first, uh, uh, downside protection is different. Basically, all you have to do is get in front of a big uh, moving uh, 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 wind and you had a huge tailwind. And just think about the last 50 years in U.S. capital markets. All you have to do is be there and stay there. Most individuals got, had challenges in 72, 3. You know, I can go through, I'm talking about 1972 because it was a bad year in 1873. Uh, and, uh, you know, you go through all these cycles in the market, and what are you doing? What we do today and what we've been doing all along is buy a business that's run by individuals that come to work every day and own it. I still own Rogers for the last 40 years. Alan Horn has done a very good job. And we're delighted with this. Stock's uh, doing well, and we like certain businesses. So uh, I can't remember what I did at that time. But by the way, we had newspapers then. 
So I would get up and, at night and get the evening newspapers. You didn't have uh, phones or anything. Well, oh, it's a different world. But they, nothing has changed. So, so if nothing's changed, uh, do you think investors should be positioning their portfolios any differently than 20 years ago? <laughs> you know, I don't like to take a broad brush. I had a client that uh, in 1900, October 19, 1987, couldn't handle the down market. You have to know, the, the individuals, everyone in this room has to know, how will they react when the market's down 20%? And you go home and you count your net worth and you say, oh my gosh, what did I do? So how, you've got to diversify your own portfolio, you've got to have your own tolerance of risk, but that's not the question. The question is, how do I create wealth over the next 50 years? How much will I make over that time period and how do I pass that along to the next generations of those that you're thinking about? And that's an important issue. And then obviously contribute to the favorite causes that we all have. So let me be a little more specific. Cabelli is a, a big organization today. No, it's tiny. Come on, it's we're Goldman Sachs, 220,000 people. We, and we're one percenters. I mean, look at Larry Fink. He's got $4 trillion. I got $40 billion. Look, I'm not comparing myself to Shaquille O'Neal. So <laughs> this is... You, uh, white guys can't dunk? What's the matter with you? <laughs> Maybe some, not me. Oh, come on. Not Jewish yeah, white guys. Yeah, but let's come back to the you can, issue. You can own a team, though. <laughs> let me come back to the, the issue. Forget how investors should be positioning portfolios. How are you, what are you investing in today? You have lots of products with Cabelli, but where is your capital? How, how is your portfolio? Well, don't like forget, today? I own uh, most of, I went public in 1999. I've never sold much stock. I give it to charity. And uh, basically, uh, I have a fairly substantial amount of wealth in two co public companies, or three or four, I should say. Uh, and uh, that's what we watch. And uh, we like to have that do nothing for 10 years and uh, do well over the next 10 years. I didn't answer the question, I'm not gonna answer it. <laughs> Look, we eat our own cookie. Our, my money, in terms of the public markets, I'm probably the largest show. We have 17 closed end funds, we run $40 billion. Uh, in the mutual funds that we run, I, uh, I'm probably violating all the rules of uh, disclosure, but uh, uh, it's all public information, so we have a significant ownership in a lot of our funds. All right, let's change the subject for a moment. Let's come back to US politics. Uh, views that you'd like to share, some that maybe weren't articulated earlier today, and how do you think that it's in, uh, affecting the, the investing landscape? Well, I'll give you an example. In our own company, I've been holding off giving bonuses. No. <laughs> 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 Is this being recorded? No. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> look, until you know what the rules of engagement are, how do you make investments if you don't know whether the tax rate in U.S. corporate is going to be 25 percent or 35 percent, if you get 100 percent depreciation versus not? How do I know how to do a transaction? Can I take the write-off? Can I leverage up and use debt in the sense of uh, what if that is non-deductible? What does that do to real estate? Do I want to buy a building? Do I want to increase an offer? There's a lot of uncertainty that's been overhanging it. More importantly, Mo, you're going to have a lot of corporate lovemaking. You're going to see a lot more deals that companies are going to announce once they see what the rules of the road are. You're going to see a lot of mergers, a lot of acquisitions in the next 12 months. And Sheila gave you her background in deals. This is white stuff. Not the black edge. So, um, coming back to another topic, Blake uh, mentioned earlier, he talked a little bit about the culture within his own organization. Um, other than the 98% of the vote that you have, could you talk a little bit more about the role of culture and the values play in your organization? Well, we start off by asking individuals that want to join us, they have to be PhDs. Excuse me? They have to be PhDs, poor, hungry, and driven. <laughs> <laughs> however, however, <laughs> One of the uh, teammates, she went to uh, Wesley and then she went to Columbia Business School and her father was a specialist on the floor. She says, let's change it to privileged, hungry, and driven. <laughs> and then I have another one of my family members who says, pop has dope. So my daughter <laughs> says, you can join us. Uh, look, we like individuals that come to work every day from five to nine, five in the morning to nine at night that have a passion for the market and are focused on working for the client. Not everyone is chosen. Many are called. Uh, and uh, so this is the... Uh, Hey, this is what we do. If we're not in the market, what do we want to do? We want to sit home and play golf? Sorry, I have nothing against any golf. <laughs> There's some people actually in the next room. That's okay. They're not hearing you. They're not insulted. I can, they can stay. <laughs> they can stay. <laughs> if you were restarting your career today, what would you do differently? I don't think I would do anything differently. I would probably uh, 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 
you know, when Mike Steinhardt saw that I was starting the firm and he had one of the most successful hedge funds, uh, he said, Mario, what are you doing? Start a hedge fund. And? and what we're doing is the following. We do have hedge funds. We started those before mutual funds. We are one of these. We do arbitrage. We wrote a book on arbitrage. We're writing another one. It came out before Boski uh, went to jail. Um, <laughs> uh, any event, that's a different subject. And uh, we're doing another one today on arbitrage. We like that business because it trains everyone. It trains everyone on the techniques investment bankers use. It, take, it trains everyone on financial dynamics. It trains them on how to use tax and other cultures so that we can see a deal and figure out what are the elements that make it successful, what are the potholes, and what are the uh, unexploded mines. So that's important. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, we're going back into private equity because our role when we analyze a company as to what it's worth is like the uh, framework and the lenses of a PE firm. What multiple of EBITDA today? What is it going to be able to sell that in five years? What are, the what are the leverage ratios and so on? So it's very simple. To you. <laughs> That's why you get overpaid and overworked. <laughs> so if we are, Cliff Asner saluted earlier today about some of his pet, pet peeves in investing. Could you talk a little bit about some of your pet peeves? Yeah, I think that the regulators have to do the following. You know, uh, if you're short stock, you should disclose it. We as a firm, if we own over 5% of a company, we own over 5% of 120 companies, we have to file within 10 days. Every 1% change has to be filed, and that's just in the U.S. and the rules around the world are all different. If you're going to short a stock, you should disclose it. So what does Ackman have of Herbalife? I have no problem. He's a terrific investor. I like the guy, but he should change that rule. And there's a whole bunch of other rules that, like, you know, uh, Charlie gets up and talks about ETFs. ETFs have a big tax advantage. It's like in real estate in the United States, you have a Section 1031. In addition to that, they have, that when you sell a piece of real estate, you can reinvest and not pay a toll tax. In addition to that, in the ETFs, they can sell stock. I had a company called Precision Cast Parts. We paid it $25. Buffett buys it at 235 My clients have to pay a tax. Even though in Canada, you're lucky, you hold it one day and it's a long-term capital gain, right? Is that still the rule? No? Yes? Apparently, yeah. Oh, okay. let's have a vote. <laughs> oh, everyone pay tax? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, um, if I had to ask you, what was the best piece of advice that you ever received? Uh, I got lucky and uh, uh, took a course in security analysis with Roger Murray. You, ne you have the right professor. You never know where his influence uh, will extend. And that you've got to give back to education, both the the current generation, the Gen Zs, but also those that need to be re-educated. So that's the advice that I would give, but also take and took. And over the years, you've, you know, you've had lots of success both in, on the financial side, but also on the philanthropic and charitable side. Uh, is there anything that you could talk about that you're most proud of? I mean, of all, all your many achievements, what are you most proud of today? Well, first of all, I never talk about politics, religion, sex, or family. Yeah, those are, we still have time. <laughs> no, I don't want to do that. I mean, look, the answer is we come to work every day and we try to make money for the client and we have many clients that are here, several of here that uh, we've managed money for a long time, so we're not unhappy about that. And just a final question, if there was only one piece of advice that you could give family offices who are trying to steward their capital more intelligently, what would that be? I think everyone in this room is smart. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. I'm not going to give you any advice on how to manage your money. I think the answer is you've got to know yourself. You've got to know what's going to happen in certain cycles in the world. And we are clearly have cycles in the world. And how are you going to react to that? How, how do you handle that environment? And uh, so you know yourself. Mario, this is fascinating. Thank you so much. Oh, you're awfully kind. You can say the truth later. <laughs> hey, yeah, thank you. I'm here all the time. Thank you. Really, Mario?